we're going to go over a couple of board review uh, questions. Um, and I'm told that there's audience response to this one, so grab your clickers so we can make this more interactive. Again, um, since yesterday, I have no financial disclosures. Uh, so the first case is a 55-year-old gentleman with alcoholic cirrhosis who is admitted for altered mental status. He has tense abdominal ascites and lower extremity edema. An initial diagnostic paracentesis was performed and showed no evidence of uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and the uh, pan-infectious disease workup was negative. He was treated with 40 milligrams IV furosemide TID in addition to his usual dose of spironolactone and lactulose. Over the next few days, his mental status improved somewhat, and he had a net diuresis of about three and a half liters. However, he remained short of breath, and now a therapeutic paracentesis of four liters with albumin supplementation was performed. The next day, he was noted to have a creatinine level of 2.1 now from a baseline of 1.3, and his urine output now dropped to 300 uh, cc's over the past 24 hours. So on exam, he's afebrile, Heart rate's 92, blood pressure's 94 over 50. Um, he's alert oriented, has scleral icterus and decreased breath sounds at the lung bases and moderate ascites, but no lower extremity edema. You see his labs there with a sodium of 119, potassium of 3.3, chloride of 82, bicarb of 27, BUN of 30, and creatinine of 2.1. His albumin was 2.3 with an INR of 2.2, PTT of 30 seconds, T bili was 30 and his urine sodium was 10. So in addition to discontinuing his diuretic regimen, which of the following is the most appropriate next step in this patient's management? Would you A, repeat, repeat large volume paracentesis with albumin supplementation, B, start octreotide, C, place a transjugular intrahepatic port of systemic shunt or tips, D, volume expand him with normal saline, or E, volume expand him with albumin. All right, so a little bit of a smattering acro across the board. Has everybody got their clickers and working okay? All right. So the answer actually is volume expansion with albumin. So A is incorrect because large volume paracentesis increases the risk of further renal ischemic injury. Um, if you thought that HRS was the diagnosis, starting octreotide may be appropriate, but you basically have to make the diagnosis of HRS first, um, and so volume expansion with albumin is needed in order to exclude sort of pre-renal azotemia as the cause. Additionally, as I will get to, octreotide alone has uh, no benefit in HRS. Um, tips might be appropriate as well for HRS, but uh, again, the initial management is, uh, is to volume expand, then you would attempt to treat with octreotide and midodrin before you would even consider uh, uh, pursuing TIPS. And TIPS has actually been shown um, to provide some short-term improvement in renal function, but of course it's uh, also associated with increased risk of encephalopathy. So in somebody who may have had uh, altered mental status recently, you know, one would consider this a potential relative contraindication. Um, volume expansion with albumin is preferred over normal saline um, as per the current recommendations, um, mostly because it's been shown to increase peripheral vascular resistance, um, but the mechanism through which it does so is, is not clear at the present time. So let's review the criteria for HRS. Um, so of course you have to have advanced hepatic failure with evidence of portal hypertension. Um, the old definition is that you had to have a serum creatinine of over 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. But if you want to go by some of the newer KDGO guidelines, um, it's actually a 0.3 milligrams per deciliter increase in uh, the past uh, 48 hours, or a 50% increase over uh, a seven-day period. Either, uh, either criteria uh, would work when you're considering the rise in creatinine. 
Um, you have to have no improvement in your creatinine after over two days of diuretic withdrawal and volume expansion with albumin. And typically the dose of the albumin that you would be giving would be about a gram per kilo per day um, up to a maximum of about 100 grams. Um, there has to be the absence of shock and no um, concurrent or recent treatment with nephrotoxic drugs. Um, and obviously the absence of intrinsic renal disease. So minimal proteinuria, minimal hematuria, and a normal renal ultrasound. Uh, so what are our treatment options? Well, for the critically ill, we typically will um, utilize a norepinephrine drip in addition to albumin. Um, we would titrate our norepi um, starting at a, at a dose of like uh, 0.5 um, mg per hour to th up to 3 mg an hour, and that's to raise the mean arterial pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury. Again, you're giving albumin to the same degree as you would if you were just volume expanding. And occasionally we'll also add um, vasopressin into this mix, starting at like 0 0.01 units an hour and, and titrating up a little bit. And the point here is to sort of um, provide a, a systemic vaso constriction um, with, and with the vasopressin to, to try and um, re reduce splanchnic uh, vasodilatation. Um, if they're less critically ill, um, there's an option of terlopressin and, and albumin in combination. Um, this isn't used very often in the U.S., um, but often used uh, in Europe and elsewhere um, because terlopressin isn't quite uh, FDA approved yet. Um, when they did head-to-head -head trials, the efficacy is similar to if, if you had somebody on norepi and, and albumin, but it's tremendously more expensive if you can get it. And again, the same sort of um, um, physiological mechanisms for, for treatment, reducing spl splanchnic vasodilatation to increase um, your GFR. Um, and in com comparison to using albumin alone, they've shown in the European studies that it does reduce mortality. So here in the U.S., we typically, for our less sick patients, um, use the uh, triple combination of the midodrine, octreotide, and albumin. Of course, with the midodrine, you might start at 5 milligrams TID and titrate up to a max dose of like 15 milligrams TID. Use the octreotide, 100 to 200 micrograms sub-Q, um, and again, the albumin infusions. Um, and as I alluded to, the, one of the answers was incorrect because actually um, the studies looking at octreotide therapy alone without the addition of midodrine had no benefit in terms of um, mortality or improvement in serum creatinine levels if, the if there was a diagnosis of HRS. All right, so case two is a 35-year-old uh, female who was diagnosed with HIV about two years ago. She's seen in routine follow-up by her primary care, and her most recent CD4 count was 220 with a viral load of 8,000. She's had a numerous opportunistic infections in the past and recently completed a course of IV acyclovir for HSV dermatitis. Her baseline creatinine about two months ago was 0.7, um, and her current medications include ritonavir, atazanavir, tenofovir, and tricytabine combination, as well as Bactrim. On exam, she's afebrile. You note that she has a resolving crusted vesicular rash on her upper trunk and arms and sort of the C6 dermatomal distribution, but the rest of her exam was pretty unremarkable. Um, her labs are as follows. So her sodium level is 132, potassium 2.4, chloride 105, bicarb 14, BUN of 60, and a creatinine of 4.5. Her white count's 3.2 with a hemoglobin of 10.8 and platelets of 122, calcium is 8.2, phos of 0.9, mag of 1.8, and an albumin of 3.7. Um, her urinalysis shows a specific gravity of 1.015, 1 plus blood, 2 plus protein, some trace white cells, nitrate negative, um, some 2 plus glucose, and your cal calculated phenol was 4%. So which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's renal dysfunction? 
maybe I shouldn't show the graphs first so you can't vote by um, democratic process. Well, we'll try it the next time, although there's only 21 votes, so there's a lot of abstention. So I guess Democratic majority wins here and is correct. Uh, the answer is tenofovir. So as you all know, tenofovir is an NRTI, um, which is well known to cause renal failure and actually even um, dialysis dependence. Um, it actually accumulates in the tubular cells, and that leads to ATN. Um, but the other feature that I wanted you to note in the clinical case was the presence of Fanconi syndrome. Um, and as well, it can also cause nephrogenic DI. Um, and because of that constellation of symptoms, you want to focus on that when you're sort of answering board questions, because they won't sort of give you extra information if it's not going to point you to, to a certain diagnosis. So how does tenofovir renal toxicity occur? Well, tenofovir is excreted by the kidneys. Um, it's done so through glomerular filtration as well as tubular secretion. Um, and actually, it's taken up on the basolateral membrane by the organic anion transporter. Um, and it gets into your renal tubular cells. Um, and if it's not excreted through the MRP2 channel um, in, uh, on the apical membrane, then what happens is you have buildup of tenofovir uh, intracellularly. And it causes significant mitochondrial da uh, damage and uh, therefore tubular cell damage. The thing to note here is that um, these two um, uh, channels by which tenofovir um, gets uh, uh, secreted from the tubules, it um, actually ha is, um, or sorry, several drugs can compete for uh, use of this particular channel for tubular secretion. So in this case, the patient was p placed on acyclovir um, for HSV dermatitis. Um, this also occurs if you have somebody on sodofovir, uh, gancyclovir, valcyclovir, and valgancyclovir, something that you know, um, may not be too uncommon in, pa in, in these HIV patients. Um, the other thing to note is, is the same mechanism occurs for ritonavir, which as you know is used to boost uh, efficacy of, of tenofovir, and this is how it does so. So it too can also cause uh, accumulation in the tubular cells. All right, case three. So this is a 68-year-old female who's referred for an elevated creatinine level of 2.0. Her baseline creatinine, which was from about six months ago, was 0 0.7. And three weeks ago, she was diagnosed with a UTI and treated with Bactrim for five days. She's no further urinary symptoms at, at this time. Her medications include the occasional NSAID use for joint pain and stiffness and over-the-counter eye drops for, for dry eyes. Her past medical history is notable for a kidney stone that she had three years ago. And her labs uh, reveal sodium of 138, potassium of 3.2, chloride of 110, bicarb of 21, BUN of 58, creatinine of 2, and a glucose of 105. UA shows one plus protein, um, RBC is negative, and white blood cell, uh, there's 10 per high-powered field. You get a 24-hour urine collection, and she's found to have 1.2 grams of uh, proteinuria per day. And her renal ultra sounds uh, pretty unremarkable. So which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's renal dysfunction? So we have a bit of a split between um, Sjogren syndrome and uh, use of, of Bactrim. Okay. All right, so as I, I think 
One of the uh, things, as I said, is to pay attention to some of the, of the uh, other signs and um, symptoms that they give you on the case um, that may be potential clues. So here, um, the most likely diagnosis is, is, is Sjogren's. Um, she had the symptoms of, of dry eyes. Of course, that's the Sika syndrome that's, that's involved. Um, a past history of kidney stones, um, evidence of a, a kidney injury, and subnephrotic range proteinuria, as well as a mild distal renal tubular acidosis. So if one were to think about this being um, AIN induced by Bactrim, um, it's unlikely to sort of cause evidence of Sika syndrome or or distal RTA. So Sjogren's syndrome, uh, as you know, is an autoimmune disease. Uh, it's immune-mediated damage to the exocrine glands, um, tears, saliva, giving you dry eyes and dry mouth. If you look at the autoantibody panel um, that you might uh, consider obtaining, um, the ANA is uh, nonspecifically positive in about 75% of cases, and the rheumatoid factor uh, in 40% of cases. And what you want to focus on is, is the use of SSA and SSB antibodies, um, because those would be the most specific to your diagnosis of Sjogren's and can help you rule out some of the other causes, as I'll mention below. Um, but the thing to note that is that, um, you know, a negative SSA or SSB is not going to necessarily rule out Sjogren's, um, and that's because it's only positive in 40% and 25% of cases, um, respectively. Um, up to 25% of people with Sjogren's syndrome have extraglandular manifestations. Um, that might in include the rare um, uh, PBC, uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, um, and also uh, renal disease. So it's really hard um, when you look at the studies to sort of get an idea of what the prevalence of, of uh, Sjogren's um, syndrome uh, leading to uh, renal dysfunction is because there's uh, prevalence is is sort of listed at anywhere between two and sixty five percent and I think the huge discrepancy is probably because some of the studies are looking at biopsy proven AIN um, to to, uh, to sort of make the diagnosis whereas other um, other studies have just looked at uh, clinical um, uh, criteria for, for considering if somebody had Sjogren's and they had AKI for no other reason, then the diagnosis would be, uh, would be made. Most often, as I mentioned, is um, Sjogren's causes AIN, um, and that was up to 71% in a case series from the Mayo Clinic. Um, but occasionally, you may see membranous and MPGN. And um, the pathophysiology of it and the reason why it leads to renal disease is, is not yet quite no. Um, the differential diagnosis that, that you want to think about is an entity called TINU, um, and that's just tubular, tubulo interstitial nephritis and uveitis. So you share some of the, some of the other clinical uh, symptoms that, that are common with Sjogren's. Um, but again, if one gets the SSA and SSB antibodies and they're positive, then you're more likely to think about Sjogren's. Um, if you have other uh, manifestations, um, like with the um, uh, uh, dry mouth and, and um, salivary glands, then you might think of Sjogren's. And um, of course, sarcoidosis can also um, mimic this because of, of its propensity to cause, to cause AIN. All right, so uh, it, it manifests as, it, as AKI in about 30%, um, but in about 40%, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't get detected until the patient's in CKD stage four or five. Now, it's thought that in, in most cases, the majority of the cases, um, patients will have symptoms of Sika syndrome on a median of five and a half years prior to developing um, kidney injury. However, there have also been case reports where kidney injury has occurred first before Sika syndromes and other uh, extra renal manifestations of Sjogren's occurs later. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you get a um, um, renal tubular acidosis that's most commonly distal RTA, although uh, proximal and uh, RTA in Fanconi's has been described. Um, there can be presence of hypokalemia either, be, either with the RTA or without. 
Um, the proteinuria is subnephrotic, and uh, people have a history of, of renal calculi and sometimes nephrogenic DI. And the treatment, uh, of course, is um, corticosteroids. So, you know, in the clinical setting, if you're considering potentially sarcoid or tinu, then, um, you know, the distinction doesn't necessarily matter early on because your treatment of choice is probably still going to be corticosteroids. All right. So the answer is A. This is Sjogren's syndrome. Mm -hmm. All right. So case four is a 34-year-old female. She's 28 plus three weeks pregnant with uh, triplets who's admitted for mild preeclampsia. She was found to have a blood pressure of 142 over 84 and mildly elevated LFTs. 24-hour urine collection showed 600 milligrams of proteinuria with a total volume of 5.5 liters. Her prior screening for gestational diabetes was negative. Uh, she's only on a prenatal vitamin. Her lab shows sodium of 130, potassium of 3.2, chloride of 107, bicarb of 26, BUN of 18, and a creatinine of 0.6, and her glucose is 102. Uh, her urinalysis, her specific gravity is 1.01, .01. she has trace protein, RBC is negative, and WBCs are negative. So which one of the following do you think is the most likely cause of this patient's polyuria? All right, so uh, the majority of you got this correct, so the correct answer is D, elevated levels of uh, vasopressinase. So in normal pregnancy, um, there obviously is an increase in your blood volume and total body water, and this leads to changes in your osmoregulation. So typically in pregnant um, people, even early, very early on in pregnancy, we see that their serum osmolarity level drops by about 10 milliosms per, per liter. And um, it's sort of like a reset uh, osmosats stat, where pregnant women are able to concentrate and dilute urine to this new level of, of tonicity. So if one were to have a normal pregnancy, you would not expect this degree of urine output, which in this case was about five and a half liters. And the definition of polyuria still remains the same whether you're pregnant or not, and that's greater than three liters per, per day. So that's why uh, answer A is wrong, and similarly why answer E is wrong. Uh, for answer B, that's unlikely that she's, she has gestational diabetes since she had a normal glucose level at the time of presentation and a prior negative oral glucose tolerance test. Um, for those of you that were wondering about C, so ADH levels in normal pregnancy actually remain about the same or, or slightly increased, okay? So, with the decrease in your serum osmolarity, what you see is your lower serum sodium level, and this can fall uh, by five millimoles per liter in, in um, normal pregnancy. Um, and th with this, there's sort of that lower threshold for thirst and, and ADH release. But I, as I said, ADH levels are often similar if you measure it in the blood um, to non-pregnant levels. And that's because even if there's increase in ADH levels, um, there's also a compensatory three-to-fold increase in clearance by vasopressinase, um, an enzyme that's produced by the placenta. Um, increased uh, vasopressinase production is more common in uh, multiple um, uh, people carrying uh, uh, twins and, and triplets. So, so um, and then also um, as pregnancy go, goes on. So be, uh, even after delivery of, um, of the baby and uh, removal of, of the placenta, you can actually have some uh, lingering vasopressinase. So people who, so pregnant ladies who do have um, uh, vasopressinase uh, related 
um, increases in their urine output can do so for, for a few weeks post-pregnancy. And of course, vasopressinase has an enzyme that uh, degrades both ADH uh, and oxytocin. So of course, vasopressinase-induced polyuria is known as gestational diabetes insipidus. Um, and its incidence is about four in 100,000 pregnancies and often diagnosed in the second and tr third trimester. Um, the transient liver dysfunction, as I was speaking about um, uh, in, this, in this particular case with the mild uh, increase in, in LFTs, either from acute fatty liver of pregnancy or HELP syndrome, can actually contribute to the pathophysiology. And the reason for that is because um, this leads to decreased degradation of vasopressinase by the liver. Um, there's also a decreased renal responsiveness to the vasopressin. And so when one diagnosis, when one diagnosed gestational DI, um, you can then give a course of DDAVP, which as you know is a synthetic analog to vasopressin, but is not degraded by vasopressinase. I know some of you are taking pictures, but I believe all of my slides will be uploaded for you guys at, at some point. So case five, a 55-year-old man is admitted to the ICU after ingesting an unknown substance in a suicide attempt. He was found confused at home and brought to the ER where he developed a seizure and then worsening respiratory failure requiring intubation. His physical exam, and this was prior to his seizure, showed uh, he was tachycardic with a heart rate of 102, respirate of 30, blood pressure was 100 over 65, and he was confused and agitated. Um, his labs were uh, sodium of 136, potassium of 4.6, chloride of 102, bicarb of 8, BUN of 28, and a creatinine of 1.2 with glucose of 100. His arterial blood gas showed a pH of 7.38, PCO2 of 13, PO2 of 68. So which of the following tests are, is most likely to establish a diagnosis in this patient. All right, so uh, most of you said B, um, solicit late level. Uh -huh. All right. Which is correct. Um, so the key here is to sort of go over um, acid base interpretation. Um, anybody want to hazard a guess and just shout out what, what you think the patient's acid base status is? Sorry, I heard it from here. Metabolic acidosis or respiratory alkalosis? So he, this gentleman here said metabolic acidosis with uh, respiratory alkalosis. Right. And of course, if one would be a little bit more specific, an anion gap metabolic acidosis with respiratory alkalosis. So of course, he's got the um, mild acidemia. The bicarb is 8, so he's got a pretty severe metabolic acidosis. If you calculate out his anion gap, um, that equals 26. Um, and then we would use Winter's formula to try and calculate an ex expected respiratory compensation. Um, and in this case, what your expected PCO2 would be, would be 1.5 times your serum bicarb level, plus 8, plus or minus 2. So in this case, if you do the arithmetic, it, it uh, equals 20. And then you compare the, what you expect to be uh, his C PCO2 level um, to what his measured PCO2 level is. And as you can see, the measured PCO2 is, is less than what you would expect, so therefore he also has a concomitant respiratory alkalosis. Um, so in salicylate intoxication, this is sort of one of those uh, to uh, toxin ingestions that you think about whenever you see this uh, particular acid-base uh, status. 
Um, and so the symptoms are more severe, actually, with chronic ingestion. With mild to moderate toxicity, you just get tinnitus, vertigo, um, some early nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. But with severe toxicity, of course, you can get encephalopathic and have seizures, cerebral edema, um, and death. Uh, pulmonary edema and ARDS can occur. Um, and of course, the acid-base status we talked about. So if you catch the ingestion early on, um, activated charcoal and gastric lavage is indicated. Um, one would try systemic alkalinization, and this helps to reduce t uh, tissue accumulation of, of the uh, salicylic acid. Um, and uh, the alkalinization actually helps to promote urinary excretion as well. Um, you could try starting them on a glucose drip um, in order to help with the CNS depression that's, uh, that's sometimes seen. But the key thing to remember is if you need to intubate and sedate them, that you must look at your vent settings because if you undervent, uh, undervent them, they c that can actually worsen acidemia and, and promote tissue accumulation of, of your salicylic acid. So when would we consider dialysis? So typically the thought is if the salicylate level that you measure at your lab is greater than 80 milligrams per deciliter, um, if, of course, uh, if there's a significant acid-base abnormality. Um, if you have a relatively high level, but it doesn't quite reach 80, but you have impaired renal function, so, you, so there's less uh, renal excretion. Um, if you have a significant CHF coma or, or sort of neurological symptoms, um, one would consider dialyzing earlier rather than later. So the next case is a 45-year-old man with CKD stage 5. His GFR is 15. He's scheduled to undergo a preemptive living donor kidney transplant in about three weeks' time. He's currently asymptomatic, and his electrolyte and metabolic parameters are adequate. And in preparation for his upcoming transplant, you discover that he's never had chickenpox or shingles, nor has he been vaccinated for varicella. Um, serological testing that you do shows he's seronegative. So which one of the following do you think is going to be the most appropriate op option for this patient? Great, so most of you want to vaccinate him and uh, delay transplantation. Which is the correct answer. So as always, you want to try and vaccinate as much as you can prior to transplant and at least 30 days prior to be optimally effective. Um, if vaccination is needed after transplant, um, most centers will actually wait until three to six months later. And the main reason for this is actually that uh, the induction therapy um, really impacts your immune response and you're just not able to generate um, uh, an immune response to your vaccination. Um, it's always important, if you can, to document seroconversion four weeks after your uh, vaccination. Um, if you're thinking about after a patient's gotten a, the transplant, inactivated vaccines are generally safe. The things that we do avoid are live vaccines. Um, and uh, so if you're thinking about potentially giving somebody a live vaccine and they're going into transplant, then you should also be making sure you're giving this um, earlier on. So it must be th over 30 days prior. And a lot of um, patients may ask you if getting vaccine, vaccinated uh, leads to rejection, and there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that rejection rates increase. Um, we always encourage close contacts and family members in the same household to be uh, immunized fully, recommending, of course, the yearly influenza vaccination. Um, it, uh, we typically recommend the inactivated injectable form as opposed to the um, nasal formulation. Um, so, as I said, with everything, non-live vaccinations are preferred. 
Um, however, if, if a family member accidentally gets a live vaccine, um, there, there's little to no risk to the transplant recipient if the family member receives a live vaccine that's MMR or varicella. And the exceptions to this is if, they get, if they're vaccinated with uh, uh, smallpox or uh, oral polio vaccines. Um, so how about the recipient and after transplant? Okay, so th um, the ones in yellow are basically uh, what we recommend uh, continue after transplantation. So of course, influenza uh, injectable yearly, the pneumovax va uh, every three to five years, um, and tetanus boosters every, every 10. Um, hep A and Hep B, we we want to encourage um, a nephrologist seeing CKD uh, four and five patients to do this all prior um, to transplant, and we're going to actually be documenting seroconversion. Um, MMR, varicella, and zoster. Okay, these are uh, live vaccinations, and they are contraindicated post transplant. Okay, so these orange ones here are contraindicated. And then the meningococcal vaccination. So we typically um, really just administer the, the, um, it, the meningococcal vaccination in our patients who are at higher risk for antibody-mediated rejection, you know, in case that they require splenectomy or uh, for ecolizumab, and that's extremely important. So, you know, if you're, if you're thinking your patient's potentially high immunological risk, then one should go ahead and vac uh, vaccinate for meningococcus. Uh, case seven. A uh, 68-year-old man with end-stage renal disease is on hemodialysis. He presents to the ER with fever and malaise and dialyzes through a left IJ tunneled catheter. His past medical history is notable for numerous failed upper arm fistulas. Uh, he's feb uh, his temp is 38.1. Um, his uh, heart rate's 98 and blood pressure 145 over 85. He's alert-oriented, doesn't appear toxic, um, and otherwise his uh, physical exam is unremarkable. Uh, you draw blood cultures on that, him, and um, the results are pending, but an initial gram stain already shows that he has gram-positive cocci. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? All right, so the majority of you picked C. What was C? C was IV Vanco for three weeks and catheter exchange over a guide wire within the next three days. Can I see back? A few of you picked uh, B, Vanco without line removal, and then a few gent lock with IV Vanco, and a few um, immediate removal. Right, so the answer is C. Um, we would recommend IV vancomycin for three weeks and a catheter exchange within the next three days. So as you all know, fever and chills are highly predictive of positive blood cultures for the dialysis patients with tunneled catheters. Um, if you're thinking about empiric antibiotics, we cover always for uh, gram-positive and gram-negatives right up front. Um, the incidence of uh, uh, GPC bacteremia, depending on the series, is anywhere from 40 to 80 percent of the time, um, and uh, GNR is in about 30 to 40 percent. Um, antibiotic therapy alone fails to clear bacteremia in nearly 70 percent of cases, which is quite significant, um, and obviously uh, uh, failure to therapy is more common if you've got a staph strain. Um, your relative risk of bacteremia is 10 times higher uh, than your risk of bacteremia if, you're, if you dialyze with a fistula. And there's a two to three-fold higher risk of, of hospitalization and, and death with catheter-related bacteremia.
So let's get back to the answers. So what are your options for the catheter management? As I said, it's uh, with, your, with the high likelihood of failure with antibiotics alone, you want to be thinking about what to do with the catheter. So your first option is, is to remove the, the tunnel catheter and, and dialyze with a temporary catheter. Um, and then replace it, obviously, at a new site once your blood cultures are negative for at least 48 hours and, and the patient is clinically improved. And so, so the success rate there is, a, a, is about 88% um, in, in these studies. If you decide to exchange the catheter over guide wire, actually there's, it's pretty much equivalent success rates um, according to the, this study. And so I would pick that answer because as we know as nephrologists, access is always you know, the bane of our existence and, and the thing that we struggle with for our patients a lot of times. And so this preserves access sites and avoids the need for, for temporary lines as well. Um, and uh, in non-randomized trials, the re recurrence rate of the same um, bacterial infection is much less than 10%. Um, if you were to think about preserving your catheter and using antibiotic lock therapy, um, there's only a 57% success rate. Um, and uh, the success is mostly if you just have a gram-negative infection and you use a gent lock. So over the next 48 hours, uh, your patient continues to be febrile and his initial blood cultures are positive for MRSA. What do you think is going to be your next step? Great, so the majority of you uh, vote for immediate removal of the catheter and dialyzing through the temporary catheter now while continuing antibiotics. Great. So um, obviously the patient is not responding to IV antibiotics over uh, an appropriate time frame, and so one would uh, escalate therapy at that point in time, and removal of the catheter is, is warranted, as, as you guys all correctly identified. All right, case eight. This is a 40-year-old woman. She has hereditary amyloidosis and uh, CKD stage five, um, who presents with symptomatic uremia. She's been advised to initiate renal replacement therapy and seeks advice as to which modality to se select. She's, she's near debilitating orthostatic hypotension due to autonomic neuropathy, but her other past medical history is otherwise negative. She anticipates that she'll probably receive a living donor kidney allograft from her husband within the next year, but workup is yet to be underway. Which of the following is not an advantage of PD over hemodialysis in this case? All right, so we have a split between A and B. So some of you do not think that she will get a survival benefit on peritoneal dialysis compared to hemodialysis. And the other half of you think that she does not have an advantage in terms of allograft loss. So those of you who picked B, that's the correct answer. So 
Um, just want to touch a little bit about the benefits of PD versus HD. So as we, uh, as we know, there's been a lot in terms of the CAN-USA studies um, that have looked at the survival benefits of PD versus HD. And really it looks like the, the biggest benefit in survival appears to be limited um, to the first one to two years. And after that, the benefit may actually be lost and PD uh, in, may be associated with greater mortality. Um, PD benefits particularly those who are younger um, with an age less than um, 55 and definitely non-diabetics. Uh, it's obviously uh, uh, tolerated a lot better in terms of the hemodynamics because of the gradual fluid removal um, and especially in the hypotension prone patients such as this one that has autonomic dysfunction. And of course, we all know the benefits of, of uh, PD in terms of preservation of residual uh, kidney function, which then ties into uh, the survival benefits. So what about graft loss? Does it matter what uh, modality of dialysis you're on prior to transplant? So interestingly, there's a greater risk of allograft loss among patients who are treated with PD prior to transplant. And it's a little bit unclear why, um, but people have postulated that it might relate to a higher incidence of allograft thrombosis through either the loss of anticoagulant factors or the activation of procoagulant factors. But interestingly, if you look more at the short term um, outcomes of your uh, following transplant, the incidence of delayed graft function is lower if your patient's been on PD. So, do I counsel my patients who are looking at dialysis one way or the other depending on their transplant options? No. I think it really depends on their other comorbidities, their age, um, their ability to do PD um, at home by themselves, um, and, their, and their overall preference. But it's just interesting to note that there, there is some differences in terms of the different modalities when you're talking about um, graft. <laughs> Uh, case nine, uh, so this is a 43-year-old uh, woman with end-stage renal disease secondary to lupus who comes in with abdominal pain, um, which uh, got worse throughout the day. She's been maintained on CAPD for about 18 months and had one prior episode of PD-related peritonitis about a month ago, and that was from COAG-negative staph. And she was treated at that point in time with cefazolin. So on exam, her temp is 101.1 Fahrenheit, blood pressure of 130 over 80. Her abdomen is diffusely tender with voluntary and involuntary guarding. Um, but the PD catheter site doesn't really look all that erythematous. So at your instruction, the ER physician drains her PD fluid. Um, it was last exchanged about four hours prior. Um, and the PD fluid uh, cell count shows 1,600 WBCs per microliter, 80% of which are neutrophils. Gram stain at this point in time is negative and your culture is pending. She started empirically on um, IP cefazolin and ceftazidine. Which one of the following would be the least likely to require PD catheter removal? All right, so the majority thought that if she had coag negative staph, uh, which is sensitive to cephalosporins, that that would be least likely to require PD cath removal. A uh, few of you thought that if the cultures grew out a micro, uh, polymicrobial mix, and then a few of you thought that if she was treated, but um, after five days of IP cefazolin, her um, PD fluid still showed a white cell count of 1,100. 
Right. So actually, did anybody pick C? No. Okay, so actually C is the correct answer here. It's least likely that you would require PD catheter removal if the initial cultures grew at MRSA. And I'll go through each of the reasons why the others aren't correct. Okay. So the distinction for, for the answer A is that if you remember from the case, she actually had a recent episode of coag negative staph peritonitis. So one would consider that a relapsing peritonitis. Um, because she has the same infection with the, or sorry, she has an infection with the same pathogen within four weeks of antibiotic cessation. Um, and it may indicate a failure to eradicate because she might have a tunnel infection or an exit site infection, but the bottom line is that it's an episode of, of relapse. Um, you need to remove the catheter if, if they have per polymicrobial peritonitis because your suspicion of an intra-abdominal process needs to be a lot higher. Um, maybe she's got diverticulitis or ischemic bowel. Um, and this is especially the case if you see multiple enteric organisms or a mix of um, gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. And um, so that's why uh, B would be an indication for PD catheter removal. Um, in D, a few of you picked this, but this would what be what we called refractory peritonitis, where we've given you appropriate antibiotics because we knew that the original culture came back and it should be sensitive to cefazolin, and yet you haven't responded within five days. So your uh, PD fluid counts, um, if they're over 1,000 by day three of, uh, of the episode of peritonitis, then that actually predicts treatment failures, and um, it's suggested that P the PD catheter be removed. E, nobody picked, but I don't think I forgot. Did I have E? Yeah. So E, you, uh, with any fungal uh, peritonitis, one should be removing the PD catheter. And then, of course, as you all know, um, uh, recurrent catheter infections or recurrent peritonitis would be another indication for PD catheter removal that wasn't on my choice of answers. Um, Dr. McMahon, would you like me to continue or just to conclude there? Um, I think this might be the last, actually. Okay. Um, so this is a 68-year-old Caucasian man with end-stage renal disease who has uh, from diabetic nephropathy. Started on maintenance hemodialysis about eight months ago when he was seen for a pre-transplant evaluation by the transplant team. He was advised to consider accepting a deceased donor with a KDPI, um, and that stands for Kidney Donor Profile Index Score, of over 85%. He comes back to you as his primary nephrologist and asks you, what your opinion on the matter is. Which one of the following statements is most correct? So most of you identified uh, uh, the answer A, which is uh, correct. So answer A was a kidney with a KDPI score of 90% has higher expected graft failure than 90% of all deceased donor kidneys recovered from the prior year. Okay. So it's always based on what the organs looked like the years prior. Okay. Um, and so if a KDPI score was 99%, then that's actually in the top 1% of the worst kidneys compared to the year before. 
Um, and the reason why I wanted to bring up KDPI scores is because of the new transition to the kidney allocation system, as uh, many of you have probably heard about in the transplant community. And um, just to t talk to you uh, in terms of how to educate your patients on the KDPI and what that means for them. Um, the donor characteristics that go into this scoring, so this replaces the um, ECD, DC, ECD um, expanded criteria uh, donor kidney um, scoring because that one basically only looked at three parameters, but this one now looks at age, height, weight, ethnicity, history of hypertension, history of diabetes, cause of death, serum creatinine, hep C status, and whether the um, donor uh, donated after cardiac death. Risk factors of increased graft, long-term graft failure. Um, one needs to know that uh, if your patient sa uh, says that they agree to a KDPI score of over 85%, they've been explicitly explained um, what that actually means. Um, so they have to sign a consent form that they are accepting these, uh, that these kidneys. Um, and uh, so not everybody gets access to these particular kidneys. Um, the KDPI score does not take into account your risk of transmission of infections from donor to recipient. Um, what we term CDC high risk um, requires a separate consent um, where candidates have to sign a form that says that they would be willing to receive organs from donors that are deemed high risk by the CDC. High risk of transmission of hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and HIV, okay? And that includes IV drug use, um, uh, males having sex with males, prostitution, high-risk sex, incarceration, um, hemophiliacs, um, or uh, other potential exposure to HIV. Um, so, you know, when I'm counseling uh, patients to determine and get their consent for CDC high risk, um, all the studies have sort of shown that um, because we uh, utilize nucleic acid testing, to test our donors prior to transplant, there's only a very small window, maybe a, t a, f a two week window um, that we would be concerned about. Otherwise, the nucleic acid testing would be positive, okay? So within that two week window is what we're looking at. So if, if, uh, if a donor was an IV drug user um, but hadn't done IV drugs in the last uh, six months, um, we would potentially still consider them CDC high risk. But obviously, if their nucleic acid testing for HIV hep and hepatitis were negative, then there's much less likelihood that the transmission would occur because they would probably not be infected. So, here, the number I have is that the combined risk of transmission of HIV, Hep B, or Hep C is less than 1%. To be honest, the number looks more like uh, 1 in 2,000 cases. Um, and I, I think I already mentioned that. Okay. That's it. Have some questions? Sure. Oh, are you asking about one and two year graph survival? Yeah. Yep. So, so, in so as your KDPI score gets greater, obviously the the graph survival curve uh, goes down. And because KDPI score is a moving target, it really depends on what organs we've been transplanting the year before. But roughly, if you have a KDPI score of over 85%, then your one-year graph survival, your two-year graph survival rate is still on the order of about 75%. Yeah, so it's still very, very high. And I think that's, that's where we need to make sure that um, um, candidates and potential recipients are still realizing that that's going to offer them an overall survival benefit when you compare it to um, 
when you compare it to dialysis. If you ask me what the long-term graft survival is going to be like, we still have to wait. The new KAS system only took into effect uh, January 2014. So we've only got two years under our belt. And as you know, we're going to need at least 10 years more in order to figure out um, even if there's any potential impact in terms of the different quartiles or quantiles of, of KDPI scores.